This podfic contains content that may be disturbing for some viewers, including mentions of violence, guns, and physical and emotional abuse. Please check out the complete list of content warnings in the description, and proceed with caution if you are sensitive to these topics. Hello my lovely little gemstones, it's Afira, and today I'll be reading When the Chips Are Down by Whiskey with Patron. Chapter 18. Oh cool, we're being chased now. Patton couldn't stop glancing around the booth their group had settled in. Are you guys sure this is safe? We'll be fine, Andy reassured him for the fifth time. She hadn't stopped messing with her laptop since they entered the restaurant. I'm not seeing any familiar signals. We're not being followed. Not yet, at least, Price mumbled. She sneered down at the food in front of her. Do you people really eat this crap? Remy bit into the burger he'd ordered. Shut up, Princey, he mumbled through the food. This is what you got. Deal with it. Patton sighed as the two of them launched into an argument. They had long since left the Starbucks behind and had opted to sit down in a fast food restaurant for a late lunch. Patton didn't think staying in one spot for too long was a good idea, but the others were insistent that they would be fine. Price grumbled under her breath. I still don't see why you can't just let me go. I don't have anything to do with this issue. Andy glared at Price. You'd give away our location just to get the bounty money. Price raised an eyebrow and didn't respond for a moment. Okay, you've got me there. She picked at the fries in front of her. This is still disgusting. Suck it up and eat your damn food, Andy snapped. Patton grit his teeth. He couldn't stand this constant arguing. He had so many things to worry about right now, and this wasn't helping his nerves. Thomas must have noticed his agitation, because he set a hand on Patton's shoulder. We'll be fine. Let's just enjoy this little bit of downtime we have right now. Patton took a deep breath. Thomas was right. He just needed to chill. Andy set aside her empty plate and continued typing. We shouldn't stick around too long, just in case. Are you guys almost done? Thomas nodded. I'll get the check. He waved a waiter over to their booth. Patton picked at the salad he'd ordered as Thomas talked to the waiter. He just wasn't hungry, despite the fact that he hadn't eaten since yesterday. He knew it was just stress, and he actually needed to eat, but he couldn't shake the anxious thoughts from his head. His worries were killing his appetite. He couldn't stop thinking about the possibility of Wrath following them. And if he wasn't thinking about Wrath, he was thinking about his kiddos. He hoped they were doing okay. And he hoped Janice was adjusting well to having the kids with him. The guy was never keen on having children. Patton finally pushed his plate aside. This wasn't helping. The waiter left to get their check. Price grumbled under her breath as she dejectedly ate her food. Remy finished off his meal, and his eyes flickered to Patton's plate. He lifted his sunglasses to give Patton a look of concern. Patton just waved a hand dismissively. He didn't need Remy worrying about him. Andy's fingers clacked on the keys of her laptop. Hey, guys, we might have a tiny problem. Patton's heart leapt into his throat. What? I've got my eye on someone, she said. They just walked in. I'm trying to get into their phone, but I can only do so much. This bitch has so many anti-malware programs just on their phone. They're on the public Wi-Fi, so I might be able to get in through there. The waiter returned. He and Thomas had a short discussion as Thomas paid for their meal. Patton kept his head on a swivel, searching for whoever Andy had found. Was it the woman walking to the counter arm in arm with her boyfriend? Was it the man in the suit who looked like he'd just walked in from a job interview? Was it one of the young college students who had just walked in as a group? Andy shot to her feet, startling the waiter. We have to go. Thomas handed the waiter a handful of twenties. Keep the change. He stood. Guys, everyone else stood and grabbed their bags as the waiter stared on. Sir, I think you overpaid. Just keep it, Thomas said. He stepped out of the booth. Thanks for the meal. The rest of them hurried after him, although Price grumbled as Andy grabbed her wrist and practically had to drag her after the group. Patton saw Remy put his hand in his pocket and heard the faint click of a gun. They're really close, Andy whispered. She balanced her laptop on one arm and let go of Price's wrist to type. Whoever follows us out of here is who we need to watch out for. They might even call for reinforcements. I, I don't know if this is Wrath or a bounty hunter, but we have to move. They rushed to the door. Thomas held it open for the others as they ran out. Remy grabbed Patton's hand and pulled him to Thomas's car. Get in the car, get in the car, get in the car, he muttered, as if repeating that would somehow magically make them get in the car safely. Price frantically glanced around the parking lot. God, if I'm seen with you, people are going to come after me, too. Can you please just let me go? Not a chance, Princey, Andy said. I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. <sighs> Fair enough. They piled into the car. Remy took the passenger seat this time, while Patton was stuck behind the driver's seat. Thomas jammed the keys into the ignition and started up the car. Where are we going now? Remy asked. Andy quickly buckled up her seatbelt and returned to her screen. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have company. 
They peeled out of the parking lot. They peeled out of the parking lot, earning a couple angry honks from the cars on the street when Thomas cut them off. This is fine, Thomas whispered, knuckles white on the steering wheel. This is totally fine. Andy, anyone coming after us? It's hard to tell, she said. There are too many signals, and we're too far away from the restaurant. Patton glanced back through the window. He didn't see anyone trailing them for the moment. But then he watched a black car pull out of the restaurant parking lot and drive after them. Patton couldn't see the driver, but he saw someone poke their head out of the passenger side window. A nervous laugh escaped his lips. We're screwed, we're screwed, we're so screwed. His panicked thoughts were interrupted by a loud bang. He nearly jumped right out of his seat. What the hell was that? He squeaked. Remy turned around in his seat. They have guns? Are you kidding me? Patton turned to look out the window. Sure enough, the person in the passenger seat was leaning out of the car with a gun in their hand, pointed right at them. Price scrambled to dig through her pockets. Shit, 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 shit. She brought out a gun of her own. Hey, sunglasses dude, you still got that gun? Yep. Remy grabbed the pistol from his pocket. Thomas grit his teeth. Okay, everyone buckle up. They ran a red light. Other vehicles honked furiously around them. Patton muttered every prayer he could think of that they wouldn't crash. He looked out the back window and saw the black car directly on their tail. They were lucky there wasn't that much traffic in this part of the city. Otherwise, they would have gotten stuck in a jam already and could have been shot to death by now. Andy frantically typed on her laptop. Patton had no idea what she was trying to do, but he doubted it would help them in the middle of a car chase. Thomas jerked the wheel to the side. A flash of pain went through Patton's head when he bumped it against the window. He realized he hadn't buckled up and quickly snapped his seatbelt in place. We're going to have the cops on our asses, too, at this rate, Remy grumbled as he loaded his gun. I'm sorry, do you want to drive? Thomas asked. Hold on, we're running another light. Patton heard another gunshot and shrank down in his seat. The car swiveled and almost collided with another vehicle. Patton half-heartedly hoped the people chasing them would get hit, but one glance behind the car told them they had made it through the intersection unharmed, and then he immediately felt a pang of guilt for hoping they would get hit. How do we get out of this? Price said, watching as the black car dodged other vehicles. There's another car coming this way from the left, Andy said. Turn right at the next street. Thomas didn't hesitate to follow her advice. He swiveled to the right and zipped down the next street. Fuck, 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 Price cursed. Sunglasses, open the roof. What? Why? Just do it! Remy reached up and flicked the switch for the sunroof of the car. It slid open. Price stood up and poked her head through the sunroof, perched on her seat. She pulled her arms up with the rest of her torso and aimed her gun at the car behind them. Patton looked through the window and saw that another black car had joined the chase. He covered his ears as three gunshots rang through the air from Price's gun. A bullet hit the tire of one car and it swerved. It didn't stop, but the change in speed put them further behind the other car. There's less traffic on Front Street, Andy said. We should be able to go straight down and pick up some speed. Thomas skirted around a semi-truck. Sounds good to me. Price ducked back into the car as the people chasing them fired off another round of bullets. Uh, seriously, how the hell are we going to get them off our ass? Remy rolled down his window. Uh, stop somewhere and fight them on foot, maybe? And that'll get us killed, Patton shouted. Thomas glanced in the rearview mirror. He slammed his foot on the brakes. Price and Remy both shot forward. Price almost fell into the front seat, and Remy hit his head on the dashboard. Patton watched as the black car shot past them. They must not have been expecting them to stop. Thomas turned the wheel and hit the gas. Tires squealed on pavement as they sped down a different street, leaving the black cars behind. Warn a dude next time, Andy groaned, rubbing her forehead. She must have hit her head on Remy's seat. Sorry, Thomas said as he moved the car past a motorcyclist. You guys okay? Just fucking peachy. Price poked out of the sunroof again and steadied her aim. Remy cocked his gun and stuck his head out the window. Why are you even helping, Princey? I thought you didn't want any part of this. We're in the middle of a car chase, sunglasses, Price shouted. We're in the same boat. If you go down, I go down, and I am not going down. She fired her gun with a grimace. Patton shrank down in his seat as Thomas picked up speed. He felt so useless. There was nothing he could do in this situation, and the others were all doing this because of him in the first place. Andy, where to? Andy grit her teeth. Take the exit. Get on a clear road. Patton yelped as the car leaned to the side. Price let loose another few bullets. Red splattered against the windows of one car she shot, her dozen bullets shattering the windshield. A semi swerved to avoid it and tipped over, blocking half the road. Nice shooting, Princey! Andy shouted. Price stuck back into the car with a grin, her red hair messed up from the wind. Thanks! She loaded her gun again. Don't kill them! Patton snapped, whirling on Price. Price shot a McLare. What else do you want me to do? Get them a bouquet of flowers and ask to be friends? Thomas kept his foot heavy on the gas as they sped through the streets. Where's the other car? Getting pretty close, Remy yelled. He fired another shot out his window. 
More gunshots rang through the air as the black car returned fire. Got any ideas on how to throw them off? Andy ran a hand through her hair and grimaced at her screen. I'm thinking! She looked up and scanned the street around them. Patton did the same. They had ended up in a part of the city that was more roads than buildings. They zipped onto a bridge that went over a tunnel. The black car followed. Patton watched the black car. He didn't know what to do. How were they supposed to get out of this mess? An idea popped into his head. He didn't like it. And it had been so long, he didn't even know if he could pull it off. Patton turned to face everyone else. Everyone buckle up! Remy raised an eyebrow, cocking his gun. But why? Just do it! Remy and Price both sat in their seats and buckled their seatbelts. Patton held his hand out to Remy. Give me your gun! Why? No time for questions! Remy furrowed his brow, but he handed Patton the gun. Patton froze for a moment as soon as he wrapped his fingers around the handle. His left index finger automatically rested on the trigger. It had been so long since he'd held a gun. He wasn't glad to have one in his hand right now. He shook off his initial shock. He rolled down the window and then unbuckled his seatbelt. What are you doing? Remy asked. Patton didn't respond. He clambered out and sat on the open window, his legs the only part of him inside the vehicle. He heard Remy shouting in confusion and concern, but Patton was in no danger of falling out of the car. He leaned against the car to keep his balance. Despite having not been in a car chase like this for years, his muscles still remembered what to do. He held the gun in both hands and aimed it at the black car. He took a deep breath to steady his hands. He pressed the trigger. He fired two bullets. Each one hit the driver's hands, which jerked back from the impact. The steering wheel coasted to the side, and the car crashed into the side of the bridge. Patton squirmed back in through the window as the sound of crunching metal met his ears. He rolled up the window, breathing heavily. The car was silent for a moment. Thomas lessened up on the gas until they were going the speed limit. They drove in silence for a few seconds, processing what had just happened. Patton held the gun out to Remy. Here. Remy held up a hand. No, he said firmly. You keep that. But- No, no, no. Remy turned around in his seat to face Patton and took off his sunglasses. Keep that. If someone comes at us, you're in charge of blasting their head off. He put his sunglasses back on and turned to face the windshield. No one spoke. Patton hesitated, but he flicked the safety on and jammed the gun into his pocket. Without anyone speaking to distract him, the guilt of what he just did started to weigh down on him. He had saved themselves, sure, but even though he hadn't directly killed anyone, he'd probably permanently disabled that man's use of his own hands. If he hadn't died in the crash, he really hadn't changed at all over the past ten years, had he? Nice fucking aim, Price whispered. Patton just nodded at what he assumed was supposed to be a compliment. He didn't want to think about it. Where to next? Thomas asked. Let's find a hotel, Andy suggested. Lay low for the rest of the day. We might have to ditch the car since someone obviously recognized it. We could roll by your house and pick up my bike, Remy offered. Two vehicles might be better than having all five of us confined to one. You read my mind, Rem. Andy shut her laptop and shoved it in her bag. Think we can get back to your house without being murdered? Price scoffed. <laughs> With Deadshot over here, I'm pretty sure we'll be fine. Patton tensed. I mean, my aim's not as good as it used to be. You hit a person's moving hands in a speeding car, Price pointed out. You're even better than I am. Patton didn't respond and just sank into his seat. He wasn't proud of that. He hoped none of them would ever bring up the subject again. They drove on in silence. Chapter 19. I will express a little emotion. As a treat. It was unfortunate that Logan hadn't come prepared to teach Roman and Remus anything. If he'd known Patton's kids would have been here, he would have brought math workbooks and some writing supplies. However, he could make do with what he had. He was lucky Janice had a printer in the living room. He printed off a few pages of some worksheets he'd found online, and found a few pencils scattered around the living room. He'd taken them to the dining room so he could teach the twins, while Virgil remained in the kitchen. Both of the twins were far behind on their math skills, although they were far ahead in their reading. To be fair, they'd been out of school for a few months back when they lived on the streets, so they still had much to do in order to catch up. Logan sifted through the worksheets. He set one in front of Remus and another in front of Roman. Both twins looked up from where they had been doodling on the backs of a couple papers with their pencils. Logan sat in the chair right between them. We're going to try some division today, Logan said. Both twins groaned in disappointment. Really? Remus whined. Oh, come on, Teach, do we have to? Roman grumbled. It's part of your education, Logan reminded them. He might not have been good at taking care of children, but convincing them to learn was often easy. 
I'll be doing some math lessons with Virgil later, if he's up to it. If you'd like, we can wait until then to start yours, so all three of you can do them together. Remus and Roman's faces brightened immediately. Can we? Roman asked. If you'd like to, you can continue drawing if you want. Both of them eagerly flipped over their papers and continued scribbling. Logan knew full well that one of the twins would get curious eventually, and flip the page back over to attempt a math problem sooner or later, which would lead to them calling Logan for help. Logan just had to give it some time. He heard the front door open and close. Jan, Lo, I'm home, DW's weary voice called out. Logan pushed himself to his feet, wincing at the pain that flashed through his side. I'll be right back. He stepped out into the living room. DW took off her blazer and tossed it to the floor. She collapsed on the couch with a horribly exhausted sigh. Busy day? Logan asked. <laughs> yeah. She sat up and leaned against the back of the couch. It took a lot to get shit sorted out. Jan's gonna have to talk to the lady whose girlfriend was shot. Moggy scheduled a meeting with her for tomorrow. The woman said she needs time to process everything. It makes sense. Logan straightened his tie. Janice is upstairs. Roman and Remus are in the dining room, and Virgil is making lunch in the kitchen. DW blinked. The kid's making lunch? Yes. Virgil enjoys cooking. I believe he and Janice would get along well in that regard. He's just making some craft dinner. It should be finished in a few minutes, actually. DW nodded. She raked her hands through her hair, which had come loose from its bun and was sticking up in coils. If you want, I can watch the twins and you can visit Jan. Logan considered it. He was going to run through some math lessons with the twins, but DW was perfectly capable of helping them with some simple division problems when they inevitably asked for help. Roman and Remus will likely ask you for help with some simple math problems, Logan said. They're both currently working on sixth grade math. I do have some seventh grade worksheets in case they find the math I gave them to be too easy. All right. DW stood and walked to the dining room. Shit, man, I haven't done math since college. Not that I remember college math much at all. Pretty sure I got tossed out a window. Logan found himself smiling at the remark as he followed behind her. I'm sure you'll have no trouble with sixth grade math. DW snorted. <laughs> Wanna bet? They entered the dining room. Roman, Remus, Logan said. I'm going upstairs to speak with Janice. DW will be able to assist you should you need help. DW flopped into the seat Logan had previously occupied. All right, kiddos, what are we doing? Logan turned to the stairwell and made his way up the stairs, leaving the three of them in the dining room. The healing wound in his stomach burned with every step, but he ignored it. Walking up a set of stairs wouldn't do any damage. He reached the top of the stairs and walked down the hallway to Janice's door. He gently knocked on the wood. Janice, he said, making sure to keep his voice quiet. When he received no response, he opened the door a crack and peeked inside. The room was bathed in the soft yellow lights that Janice preferred. The curtains over the windows were shut, blocking out the bright sunlight. Janice was sitting at the desk to the side of the room, hunched over with his face in his arms. He had taken off his suit jacket and bowler hat. Both were tossed haphazardly to the floor. Logan was tempted to leave. He didn't know if Janice was sleeping or not. However, Janice raised an arm and gave a half-hearted wave to let Logan know that he was still conscious. Logan shut the door behind him. Can you speak? He asked softly. A little. Janice's quiet voice answered. He lifted his head and looked up at Logan. Logan strode over to the desk and sat on the edge of it. He was worried about Janice. It wasn't often that he shut down after work like this. Then again, Janice didn't often experience things like this at work. He was mostly shut away in his office. Logan reached out and ran a hand through Janice's hair. Would you like to talk about it, Sunshine? Pet names weren't something Logan used often, and neither was physical contact. Those were affections Janice tended to use more. However, he'd found that expressions of love and concern eased Janice's nerves. Janice took a deep breath. He ran a gloved hand over his face and remained that way, leaning on the desk with Logan's fingers carding through his hair. I feel... unprofessional, Janice whispered finally. I'm the leader of a crime ring, for fuck's sake. I shouldn't be upset over seeing one person get shot. I've seen dozens of people get hurt. I've killed dozens of people. I don't know why this one is bothering me so much. Logan gently scratched at the hair in the back of Janice's head. Is there anything specific about the situation that's bothering you? Janice leaned down again to cover his face with his arms. Logan kept his hand in Janice's hair. I, I don't know. Everything has suddenly changed over the past day. The kids are in the house, and I'm just aware of their presence, even if I can't see them, and it sets me on edge. I don't know how to properly talk to them. I accidentally made one of the twins cry yesterday. Roman, 
Yes, I snapped at him. I didn't even know I did it. Dennis sat up again. Virgil will hardly speak to me. And on top of the issue with the kids, I go to work this morning to a huge problem and get overwhelmed almost right away. The only thing I could manage to do was get Virgil out of the room while everyone else handled the issue. I feel... incompetent. I rushed out of the room without helping. Everyone else must think I'm pathetic for needing to leave like that. Logan thought about Janice's words. Janice often blew situations out of proportion. It was more than likely that no one thought of that of him, and only thought he had been focused on removing Virgil from the situation. Everyone else probably thought you were focused on Virgil, Logan answered. There is no need to feel embarrassed about helping Virgil leave an anxiety-inducing situation. Besides, there is no shame in leaving a situation you can't handle. Even if it had been only you, you don't have to make excuses for anyone. You are the boss. And if you want to leave something for everyone else to deal with, you can. You can't control when you get overwhelmed. So if you need to leave, do it. I'm sure Emil Chimera would tell you the same. Janice heaved a sigh. He did. He leaned into Logan's hand and shut his eyes. Thank you. No problem, darling. Janice smiled a little. Look at you with the pet names. What are you, drunk? Logan felt his lips twitch into a grin. No, I'm not. Do you feel any better? A little. Thank you, dear. Logan leaned down to plant a kiss on Janice's forehead. Janice hummed contently at the affection. He angled his head upwards to capture Logan's lips with his own. Logan couldn't hold back a smile as Janice began to pepper small kisses all over Logan's face. A giggle that bordered on childishly giddy bubbled up in his chest. He had come in here to comfort Janice, and of course, the man had turned the figurative tables in order to sprinkle affection on Logan instead. Or maybe the actions of expressing his love for Logan was a form of comfort for Janice in itself. Either way, Logan wasn't going to protest. The door opened and they both jumped away from each other. They stared at the open door, where Virgil stood with two bowls of mac and cheese and a wide-eyed look on his face. He took a step backward. Uh, I can come back if you- No, it's alright, Logan interrupted. He pulled away from Janice and strained his tie. You can come in. Virgil rocked back and forth on his feet, seeming unsure, but he stepped into the room. I made lunch. It's not much, but DW said I should bring you some. I mean, if you're hungry. I don't know if it's even good. I haven't eaten it yet. I'm sure it tastes fine, Virgil. Logan stood and took the two bowls from Virgil's hands. Thank you for the meal. I'll be downstairs shortly after lunch in order to begin some math lessons with you and your brothers. Virgil kept his gaze trained on the floor. Okay, sorry for bursting in like this. Janice cleared his throat. The pale blotches on his face were flushed red with embarrassment. Thank you, Virgil. Virgil turned to the door. I'm going to go bleach my eyes now. See ya, Chimera. He waved with a two-fingered salute and left the room in a rush. He shut the door behind him. Janice sighed. Well, that was embarrassing. He's never going to take me seriously anymore. Logan mumbled as he set both bowls on Janice's desk. He liked to seem professional around the kids he tutored, and now that Virgil had seen him giggling like a schoolgirl, his entire reputation as a serious adult had gone entirely down the drain. He felt Janice's gloved fingers intertwine with his own. I take you seriously, Janice said with a genuine smile. I know, darling. Logan pressed a kiss to Janice's head. Now eat up. After lunch, Janice finally changed out of his work clothes and into a t-shirt and a pair of shorts. He'd kept his gloves on, of course, but he shoved a second pair into his back pocket, since his current pair was going to get covered in dirt. He'd had a tiring day already, so he felt his might as well cool down with some gardening in the backyard. He carried a tray of pansies to the flower bed lining the porch and set them down, trying to clear his mind of the racing thoughts. He wanted to get the hostage situation out of the way. Stressing about it now was tiring. He was tempted to hop right back into the car and drive back to the bank just to get the problem over and done with. However, he knew that Emil would send him right back home the second he saw him. So instead of getting anything productive done, Janice was stuck at home digging in his flower bed. He heaved a great sigh and carefully dug a shallow hole with his hands. The hostage problem wasn't the only thing bothering him. He still didn't know what to do with the kids. He wanted them to feel safe for the amount of time they were staying with him, but he didn't know how to help them feel comfortable in the house. He had a few ideas, sure, but he didn't know if the kids would be up for it. The back door opened. Janice looked up to see D.W. walking onto the porch in a swimsuit, a towel draped over her arm. I'm going to do a couple laps, she said, hopping off the steps and making her way across the yard to the pool. Have fun, he called as he pulled the pansies over to him. 
He gently took one from the tray, with its square of soil, and set it in a shallow hole he'd dug. He packed dirt around it to fill in the hole. He picked up the tray and moved to another empty spot in the flower bed. He let his thoughts wander as he planted the pansies in his garden. The kids were inside the house with Logan, working on some sort of math thing that Janice didn't particularly care about. All Janice cared about was getting the hostage situation sorted out, and figuring out what to do about Pat and Hart's children. It felt like all of his issues were suddenly piling up. He knew there were technically only two problems, but god, they were big problems. He tried not to worry about the hostage situation, since that would resolve itself tomorrow, hopefully. Janice heaved a great sigh as he planted the last flower from the tray. He'd come out here to relax, but he'd just ended up working himself into more stress. He straightened his sun hat and walked back up to the porch, where a few more trays of unplanted flowers sat. He could hear DW swimming back and forth in the pool, which made it difficult to decide what to plant next. He still had some petunias he needed to find room for, but there were also a few snapdragons he had to work into the flower beds. He turned away from the flowers in a frustrated huff. He needed to figure out how to solve one problem, at least. Janice stepped off the porch and walked over to the pool. He stayed well away from DW's splash zone as he sat down and dipped his feet in the water. She was the only reason they'd gotten a house with a pool in the first place. She had insisted they have one, despite the fact that she was the only one out of the two of them that ever used it. Janice just didn't like the feeling of being submerged into water, and he especially hated getting his hands wet. He swished his legs through the water and watched DW swim to the other side of the pool. He had an idea on how to help the kids, but he'd need a second opinion. DW pushed off the opposite ledge and swam back over to the side of the pool Janice was sitting on. She popped her head out of the water and grabbed the edge, taking deep breaths. She shook her head and water sprayed everywhere. Janice flinched when a droplet splattered on his face. DW reached for the water bottle she'd set down near the pool. She popped it open and paused when she saw Janice. Oh, hey Jan. What's up? He shrugged. Just thinking. DW took a swigger for water. About what? What to do with the kids? Janice tugged at his dirty gloves. I just want them to feel comfortable here, and I want to feel comfortable around them, but- But there's strangers in your house, DW finished. Exactly, Janice sighed. I don't know how to deal with children, and now that there are three of them under my responsibility, I don't know what to do. Well, why don't you talk to them? Janice hesitated. I'm a little afraid to speak to them. DW raised an eyebrow. Jan, you're telling me that you faced Patton Hart when he was at the top of his career and gotten out of there alive, and you're afraid of talking to a 15-year-old. I know, it's completely illogical. Janice scoffed. He idly kicked his feet through the water. But what if he doesn't even want to speak with me? You won't know until you try. DW pushed away from the edge and floated in the water. Are you sure you don't need an appointment with Emil? I'm fine, he reassured her. He thought about his options. It couldn't hurt to maybe try talking to the kids. I'll talk to Virgil later. Thank you, Dorothy. No problem. She turned and dived back under the water. Janice took his legs out of the pool and shook the water off. He wasn't going to interrupt the kids' tutoring lesson, but he might as well keep gardening if he couldn't go back to work. Chapter 20. I can tolerate the emo kid. Virgil waggled his pencil between his fingers and looked at Roman and Remus across the table. Both were busy trying to work on some division problems. Mr. Minder had left the room to check his wound again. Virgil had almost forgotten that Mr. Minder had gotten shot just last night. Virgil set down his pencil, unable to properly focus on his own math. You guys want to switch around the betting pool? Roman and Remus both perked up. Remus furrowed his brow and tapped his pencil on the worksheet. What do we have on the table right now? We've got my old Ever After High Raven doll. Virgil said. That one rat skull you found in an alley, and Roman's collection of shiny things. Are we changing our bets? Roman scratched his chin, deep in thought. I'll change it from two shiny things from the collection to three, and I bet the next time we see them, Dad and Remy are gonna be together. Remus nodded thoughtfully. I'll throw in a weird jacket rock I found in the sidewalk. You want to change what the bet is? Virgil asked. It's gonna be hard for Dad and Mr. Minder to get together, since Mr. Minder is with Mr. Chimera. Hmm, you've got a point. Remus scratched his chin. I bet Dad and Remy aren't gonna be together when we see them next, but they'll realize that they fell in love while Remy was protecting Dad, and they'll decide to be together soon after they get back. Roman gasped out loud. That would be so cute! Remus turned to Virgil. Verge, got anything to add? 
Virgil considered his options. I can toss in an old cloak from another raven doll I got customized a year ago. And I bet... Virgil grinned. I bet they're going to be engaged by the time they get back. Both Roman and Remus gasped at that. I want to be a flower boy, Roman squealed. You think they're going to be that close already? Remus asked. They've known each other for years, Virgil pointed out. Remy's pretty much a second dad to us at this point. I'm starting to think they're already together and just hiding it. Roman scrambled off his chair. Hang on, I'll be back. I gotta write something down. Virgil and Remus exchanged a knowing glance. There was no stopping Roman when he was hit with writing inspiration. Unfortunately, the kid was a hopeless romantic, despite having never been in a relationship ever in his life, so inspiration often hit when they discussed their father's mostly non-existent love life. Virgil rested his elbows on the table, kicking his legs back and forth. Re, you working on your math? Nope. Remus held up his paper. Been drawn. Virgil peered at the page. Remus didn't write like Roman did, but he could certainly draw. On the back of his worksheet was a sketch of an impressively detailed sea monster, along with a little human figure floating in front of it, staring horrified into the monster's eyes. If they had pencil crayons, he could have colored it and shaded it as well. Looks cool, Virgil said. You draw anything else? Remus hesitated as he lowered his paper. Just, just stuff. Virgil didn't press him for details. Remus often drew scary, graphic things that popped into his head. Mr. Minder said it was good for him to have an outlet to express his intrusive thoughts if he didn't want to speak about them. Due to the constant doodling of his disturbing thoughts, Remus had gained some incredible drawing skills and moved on to drawing other things as well. The door behind Virgil swung open and Mr. Minder entered the room. He glanced around in confusion. Where's Roman? Writing. Remus answered as he flipped his worksheet back over and continued to doodle around the edges of the page. Mr. Minder sighed and sat down in one of the chairs. This is math time, not English. And Remus, that goes for you too. You both need division practice. Remus sighed, but he turned back to his math. Virgil did the same. Footsteps thudded on the stairs and Roman burst into the room with a happy grin, a notebook in his hands. His gaze settled on Mr. Minder and his smile melted. Oh, sorry, Teach. I was just... I know, Roman, Mr. Minder said. Don't worry, I'm not upset. We need to focus on your lessons for now. Is that all right? Roman scuffed his feet on the floor. Can I just write down some jot notes? Yes, you can. You can keep your notebook open while you work in case you need to write anything down. With that, Roman's expression brightened more, and he rushed up to his chair. Virgil scribbled down the answers to the math problems Mr. Minder had given him. He was only supposed to be on 10th grade math, but Mr. Minder had him move on to 11th grade stuff a while ago. He punched equations into his graphing calculator as Mr. Minder helped the twins with their division. It didn't take long to finish the worksheet. This stuff was relatively easy. He waggled his pencil back and forth and let his mind wander as the other two worked. Janice was covered in dirt by the time he went back into the house, but he was okay with that. Gardening did eventually help him sort out his thoughts. Now all he had to do was get started making supper and try to talk to the kids. Well, and find a vase for the roses he'd clipped from his rose bush for Logan. Call Janice sappy, but he liked cheesy romantic gestures, and he thought Logan would like flowers. He walked into the house, roses in one gloved hand. Dirt clung to the yellow fabric. He'd have to put on a clean pair before he stepped into the kitchen. He walked up to the dining room door and nudged it open. Surely there was a vase somewhere in the dining room he could use. Janice stopped in the doorway when he saw that the kids were sitting at the table, along with Logan. All four of them looked up at Janice as he entered the room. He was sure he looked a little ridiculous, with dirt-covered gloves, a crooked sun hat on his head, and a bouquet of roses in his hand. Logan stood up from his chair with a smile. Janice, where did you get those roses? Janice felt his face heat up. Ah, uh, my rosebush bloomed, and I thought I would bring some inside. And not for you, obviously. Just to brighten the atmosphere of the place. I mean, why would I bring a bouquet of roses to the man I've loved for years? Roman gasped out loud. That's so cute! He squealed. Are you married? Janice was sure the pale side of his face had turned completely red. He cleared his throat and turned his gaze to the floor. It was so frustrating that he couldn't keep his composure when it came to Logan. Logan gently took the flowers from Janice's hands. They're lovely, dear. He pecked Janice on the cheek. I recall seeing an empty vase in your room. I'll take these upstairs. I can also take your dirty gloves so you can get started on dinner. Logan shifted the roses to his arm and gently tugged Janice's gloves off. Ah, thank you, Janice said. Logan turned and walked to the stairs, flowers and dirty gloves in his hands. Janice felt a little awkward, being alone in the same room as the children, so he turned to go to the kitchen. So are you guys married? 
Janice paused and glanced back at the kids. Roman stared at him eagerly, waiting for an answer to his question. Janice took his extra pair of gloves out of his pocket and pulled them on. That is not your business, he said quietly, trying to keep his tone flat and calm so Roman didn't take his answer harshly and get upset. Roman's face fell, but luckily he didn't start crying. He sat back down and scribbled something in a notebook that was open on the table next to a math worksheet. Janice shot a glance at Virgil. The kid wasn't doing any work. Instead, he was wiggling his pencil back and forth in his hand, staring down at the table. One look at the worksheet in front of him told Janice that Virgil must have already finished whatever he was supposed to be working on. Well, now would be as good a time as any to try and talk to him. Virgil, Janice said, already feeling awkward about the conversation, despite the fact that he hardly said anything yet. In the letter your father wrote me, he mentioned that you enjoy cooking. I was wondering if maybe you'd like to assist me in making supper. That is, if you're finished with whatever work Logan has you doing. Virgil exchanged a confused look with Rowan and Remus. He tapped his pencil on the table as he thought about the offer. I mean, I guess. Are we going to start cooking, like, now? We can, yes. It's late enough that we can start whenever you want. Virgil blinked. He still seemed a little confused by Janice's offer, but he stood up from his chair. All right. He looked at his brothers. Tell Microsoft Nerd I'm done with my math. Remus nodded. Gotcha. Virgil brushed past Janice and made a beeline for the kitchen. Janice hesitated, but he followed. There was no reason for him to feel so awkward. He was the one who had asked Virgil for his help in the kitchen in the first place, after all. He took off his hat as he entered the kitchen. Virgil was already at the stove, staring at the buttons as if trying to figure out how it worked. So, what are we making? Virgil asked. Janice set his hat on the island. Well, I hadn't actually decided yet. I was going to ask you what you wanted to make. Virgil blinked. Oh. He twirled his necklace in his fingers. This might sound dumb, but could we have pancakes? That sounds perfectly fine to me, Virgil, Janice assured him. It was a bit of a relief that Virgil felt as awkward as he did. At least he wasn't alone in his nervousness. Dad has a recipe we use for pancakes, Virgil said. We don't need pancake mix. What all do you need? Where's your flour? Virgil asked. Janice strode to the pantry and opened the door. An open bag of flour sat on the floor. Just in there. He crossed to one of the cupboards and grabbed a measuring cup from inside. He set it on the counter and walked to one of the drawers to grab a mixing bowl. He returned to the counter to see Virgil standing there, waiting with a cup of flour. He set the bowl down and Virgil dumped the flour in. Virgil hurried back to the pantry for another cup of flour. What else? Janice asked, as Virgil dumped in the second cup. Virgil gnawed on his bat pendant. Do you have something to write with? He muttered around his necklace. Janice turned to the counter. He was sure he'd seen a notepad somewhere in one of the drawers. He opened one and rummaged through it. An old memo book popped up in the mess, a pen jammed through its coils. He took it out and held it out to Virgil. Virgil took the notepad and tugged the pen out from the binding. He flipped the book open, scanning for a blank page. He set it on the island to write. He scribbled some words on the page and slid the notepad over to Janice. Janice leaned down to peer at the words Virgil had written. A recipe was scrawled on the page. Janice straightened once he'd read over the recipe. He actually found it quite impressive that Virgil could remember an entire recipe from scratch. Janice cooked almost every day, and yet he hadn't committed a single recipe to his memory. I'll grab the ingredients, Janice said. He walked to the pantry and peered around for the sugar. Goodness, he needed to organize this place. This place is a mess, he muttered, pushing aside a can of soup. Just like my life. Virgil's voice mumbled. Janice snorted at the remark. He found the bag of sugar and grabbed it off the shelf with both hands. He left the pantry and set it on the counter. Virgil must have found the measuring spoons, because he dug a tablespoon into the sugar and dumped it in the bowl with the flour. Janice retrieved the milk, eggs, and various other things from the fridge and pantry, allowing Virgil to work in near silence. The kid seemed more in his element in the kitchen. He bustled about like he'd been using this kitchen his whole life, cracking an egg in one hand while uncapping the vanilla with his other. Janice didn't know whether he should step in or if Virgil even remembered he was there. Virgil reached to shut the egg carton. His arm nudged the bag of sugar, and it began to tip over. Janice lunged forward and pushed it upright before it could spill all over the counter. Virgil jumped back as if he'd just noticed the mistake, clutching his bat necklace for dear life. Holy shit, he blurted, back pressed to the island. He frantically muttered a dozen apologies as Janice pushed the sugar closer to the wall, where it wouldn't be in danger of falling. Sorry, Virgil mumbled. Sorry, sorry, I didn't see it. I... Virgil, Janice said, interrupting Virgil's frantic muttering. It's all right. No harm done. Even if it had fallen, it's just a little sugar. Are you okay? Virgil raised his necklace to his mouth. Yeah, just... I, I guess I forgot you were here. His shoulders tensed. 
God, I'm sorry. I've been doing everything. Did you want to do something? Janice shrugged. Doesn't matter to me. Do what you want. Virgil still looked uncertain. Are you sure? Stop second-guessing yourself, Virgil. You can do what you want to. I'm not your parent. You don't always have to look to me for direction if you don't want to. Virgil grimaced. I guess... Is there another problem? Janice asked. It's stupid. Virgil sighed. It's just... You're here and you're not doing anything, so I'm anxious that you're gonna watch me and judge me. It's dumb. Janice glanced up at the cabinets. I'll get all the plates and utensils for when it's time to eat. I won't be paying attention to you, and you can do your thing. Virgil furrowed a brow, as if surprised at that. Uh, sure. He turned back to the bowl of batter. As Virgil finished mixing the ingredients together, Janice grabbed a frying pan from a cupboard in the counter and set it on the stove. He turned the stove on with a glance at the recipe Virgil had written down to make sure he put it at the right heat. He was glad that Virgil was able to do something he enjoyed, but Janice still couldn't shake that awkward tension in the air. Having kids in the house was a lot more nerve-wracking than he ever thought it would be. But Virgil, Janice said as he opened the cabinet of plates. Virgil tensed at the sound of his voice. Yeah? I know you might not be comfortable in this house yet, but I just want you to know that if you ever need anything, and I mean anything at all, you just have to ask. DW and I are willing to accommodate for you and your brothers. He adjusted the heat on the stove. So, is there anything you might need? Virgil poured some pancake batter onto the pan. Janice still felt awkward, but the tension seemed to have dissipated a little. I'll think about it, he said after a moment. Can you grab the syrup? DW set her fork down on her empty plate and pointed to Janice across the table. Jan? Janice looked up from his own plate, where he was currently dragging a forkful of pancake through a puddle of syrup. Yes? Can you please use this recipe next time you make breakfast? Absolutely not, Dorothy, Janice said, raising his fork. You know I'm completely incapable of following a recipe when I make food. Good. DW looked at Virgil, who appeared a little confused at the exchange. This is your dad's recipe? Virgil shrugged and turned his gaze to his mostly empty plate. Yeah. Well, your dad's a fucking genius. Watch your language around the kids, Logan reminded her as he wiped a splotch of syrup off his face with a napkin. It's okay, Remus said. I already know what fuck means. Roman set down his fork. Remus, you can't say that. In response, Remus set down his own fork and cupped his hands around his mouth. Fuck, he shouted. A language, Janice and Virgil said at the same time. They glanced at each other awkwardly before turning their attention back to their food. DW gazed around the table as the twins started arguing over curse words. Unlike last night, the two of them were loud and excited. DW chalked it up to the fact that they had gotten a familiar meal and felt more at home with Logan in the room. They playfully argued back and forth while Logan tried to separate them so they wouldn't get out of hand and knock over their plates. Virgil had been quiet for most of their meal, but DW caught him smirking every time Logan put himself between the twins and ended up with syrup or icing sugar on his tie. Remus had launched a strawberry at their tutor and it hit him in the forehead, which almost pulled a full-on laugh from Virgil. As for Janice, he mostly stayed focused on the pancakes on his plate. But every time Logan sat down after dealing with the twins, Janice and Logan would hold hands under the table. Neither Janice or Virgil contributed to the dinner conversation much at all, but this was already a stark contrast to the lackluster, quiet meal they'd had the night prior. With Virgil added to the table, Roman and Remus seemed to feel more comfortable, and with Logan in the house, well, DW might even go so far as to say that this felt a little bit like a family. But only a little. She wasn't going to get too attached to the kids or anything. They would have to go home eventually anyway. However, looking at Janice's face, she couldn't help but notice something. He was smiling. A genuine, happy smile. That was something he did so rarely, DW could count the amount of times it had happened in the past year on one hand. DW found herself smiling as Logan struggled to separate the twins from each other again. Despite the awkwardness and the anxiety and the overall shitty situation that had caused this, these kids being dropped on their doorstep was not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss the rest of this series. If you like what you hear and you want to read more, you can find the link to the fic and the author in the description. If you want to check out other podfics I've done, you can click on the playlist linked on the screen. See you next time!